leave aside sensitivities. We're going to leave aside politics. And we're going to talk about people who have achieved, who have achieved and become something as a result of their passion and what they have brought together with the roots that they've come from, right? And that's the reason why we decided to introduce um, the, this, this particular four-day international webinar with a very Southern perspective in thinking uh, with the both of you. We start with the both of you. Uh, we, we have about 40 minutes, I would say 40 to 45 minutes. And I wanna make sure that both of you get equal time. I also want to make sure that we hear Rafi from you. We, we would like to hear you play the duduk um, and we would like to hear you, Jose, uh, you know, perhaps recite a few of your very famous and very strong and hard hitting poems. I think, uh, you know, I've been reading up on Citizen Illegal and gosh, uh, each one of those poems in some way or the other touched me. Uh, but here's first mm -hmm. to Rafi. Uh, Rafi, tell me this. I'm, I'm from India, Rafi. So we're far away from mm -hmm. Armenia and Lebanon, the connections that you bring. But I'm going to say your last name, Chilingirian. Is that right? Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So <laughs> Rafi Chilingirian. And, and you know Rafi as well. You have in India, Ravi. Absolutely. Rafi. <laughs> we, we, have a, we, have, we have the Ravis and we have the exactly. Rafis. Because exactly. one, of, one of India's most famous epic singer or singer of epic proportions, Muhammad Rafi, uh, is, is one you that, so, so you come, uh, you, you're, you will always be a guest for any Indian, my friend. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So Rafi, what's special about you is that you play an instrument, which to be very honest with you, I had read up only after I heard about you, the duduk. Mm -hmm. um, and what I read up about the duduk, or when I when I read about the instrument, I understand that it is a it is said to express the music that that this instrument uh, exemplifies is said to express the soul of Armenia, and I thought mm -hmm. that was very special, you know, in reading it out along those lines. So, Rafi, without further ado, some of those elements that we would like to hear from you because we want to hear your own background. What does it mean mm -hmm. to be an Armenian in Lebanon? You know, what, is, what does it mean to be both, a mixture of both? Uh, how has music contributed to your own life? Uh, and what are you doing with that music to empower others? What is that family background story and, and all of that? So Rafi, really, over to you. So thank you, Nair, for this opportunity. And uh, for giving me this time to present about uh, Armenians within, I mean, in the diaspora as uh, used to be migrants, now part and parcel of the identity of uh, Lebanon, Syria, and other uh, countries where Armenians live. So let me give a, a quick a background of the heritage and the ancestry, and then talk about the language, how that uh, unfolds within the uh, Arabic Lebanese context and then talk about the socioeconomic factors when they when the first Armenians like my grandparents when they arrived um, uh, because of the other uh, uh, the war and then the genocide factors the belonging issue where the identities of both Lebanese I'm, I'm Lebanese I'm also Armenian at the same time how does that is that is that is that uh, contradictory are there any um, uh, fusion uh, uh, within that identity factor and then of course how does how I as an Armenian was able to uh, retain the Armenian culture within the Lebanese context and how how does that work out within the Lebanese context so I'm, I'm going to give you and then we go uh, to I go into uh, the Armenian instrument to the Duke and also play uh, uh, a piece on the on the Duke uh, which I'll explain later, the lyrics of it. So uh, the, the, basically the heritage and ancestry, almost every Armenian knows where they originally come from. Uh, or, uh, you know, uh, the history, uh, uh, Armenians didn't come to Lebanon as uh, tour tourists. Uh, they were uh, driven out of their homelands uh, during the 1915 Armenian genocide within the Ottoman Empire when there was World War I going on at the same time. So. Uh, 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 the Armenians uh, had to leave their uh, uh, original ho homeland and uh, homes 
places like Adana, Aintab, Marash, Yozgat, Urfa, Diyarbak here, these are all known, uh, even in my generation, uh, we know where our roots go back to, which is originally, uh, these are, uh, this was part of the Cilician uh, Kingdom, uh, now part of Turkey, north of Syria on the Mediterranean. Uh, so my paternal side uh, comes from uh, both Adana and then the Cis region, where the Armenian Apostolic Catholicos aid originally resided. Uh, today, after the genocide, it is re-established in Antilias here in Lebanon. Uh, uh, language. So many Armenians of the generation that escaped the 1915 genocide did not know Arabic. So there wasn't much communication with the non-Armenian Lebanese neighbors. Uh, later, as the Armenian children started going to school and learning Arabic, uh, were the communications established with the neighbors. Most of the first residents did not even know Armenian uh, language. They only knew Turkish. My grandmother from my father's side learned Armenian with her children while my grandfather only talked, uh, didn't learn Armenian or Arabic, he only talked Turkish. Today, Lebanese Armenians speak four languages, Armenian, Arabic, English, French, and to a certain extent, understand Turkish. There are uh, several well-known media anchors today and figures on Lebanese TV stations, such as Zaven, who has his own program, Paula uh, Nishan de Harutunyan, who has his own program uh, in, in, Lebanese, in the Arabic language, of course. So you can see how that shifted between generations and now they're part and parcel of the identity of the Lebanese uh, society. So uh, what about the socioeconomic factors? Let me go into that, delve a bit into that. Those who escaped the Armenian genocide uh, uh, perpetrated by the Ottoman Empire resettled in what is now called Syria and Lebanon, there was no Lebanon, it was all part of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, Lebanon was later established. They quickly built schools and churches. Uh, this was right after the genocide. They were thinking about uh, building churches and schools and started rebuilding their lives again, educating and feeding the young children. Many Armenians settled in camps first. However, the Armenians were uh, are, are industrious and skilled craftsmen that they were able to quickly move out of the camps and establish their own marketplaces and neighborhoods like Burj Hamoud, Hajan, and later Anjar, which is in the Beka Valley. I have non-Armenian friends today. A, a few months ago, there was a discussion. Like They asked me, like, how is it that the first Armenians who came were driven out of Syria? They came here, they, hadn't any, they had nothing, but they were able to establish and recreate themselves in Lebanon while uh, so there he was trying to understand how is that possible when 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 a community that's driven and uh, stripped of their monies and properties and they're re able to reestablish so that made me understand uh, look how the how 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 the armenians are also looked and perceived that made me i wasn't asking that question but that that, that that's a question that was asked to me and i i was like i was also surprised that uh, they would see looking at it in a positive way as well re-establishing themselves. So what about belonging? Armenians feel themselves part of the Lebanese political system where the par parliamentary seats are reserved based on confessions. Um, uh, as soon as Lebanon became independent, Lebanese Armenians, along with all the residents and the population, took, their, took, took up the Lebanese IDs. Uh, I am Lebanese, but I also can't forget my, my uh, Armenian identity, culture, heritage, and history. Uh, the Lebanese society being a multi-sectarian uh, uh, cultural society, I feel as an Armenian a piece from that beautiful mosaic of Lebanon. I've served in the one-year mandatory army service myself in Lebanon, and I've seen this mosaic uh, myself and all the confessions and sects intermingling and talking uh, to each other rather than fighting that uh, Lebanon has seen uh, in the 90s and 80s and 70s. Armenian cultural uh, retainment and how does that come into play within the Lebanese society as an Armenian? Uh, so the, uh, the, so uh, the Armenian genocide has left a huge pain within the Armenian diaspora. Uh, the diaspora was itself the result of the genocide. It wasn't like people migrating only because of, uh, uh, to find work. 
Uh, so in order to reach that justice, uh, like uh, uh, Turkey uh, uh, recognizing, giving restitution to the Armenians, like the Germans did to the Jews in Holocaust, during the Holocaust, after the Holocaust. Uh, so they, the Armenians try to keep their identity and language and, and culture. That's like, that's, 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 that's like keeping their identity is a, is a, like a get pushback to the genocide, like an answer to the genocide. No, we will remain Armenian. We will, we will keep our identity because of that, the, the, the history that we have. So it's, it's, it's like that um, sub, uh, subconscious thing that's going on there. Uh, Armenians also have a very rich culture uh, in terms of music, dress, dance, food, architecture, carpet weaving, embroidery, church chants, alphabet, language, history that goes back to the Greek, Syriac, and Assyrian times. They are very proud of their heritage. They are strongly uphold and, 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 and maintain and, and uh, keep. Today, Burj Hamoud, uh, which was mainly established by Armenians, has two theaters, several confession-affiliated schools, Armenian Apostolic, Armenian Catholic, Armenian Evangelical, three Armenian newspapers, cultural institutions, medical centers, social centers, elderly house, special needs school, sports organization, scouts, university, which is uh, Haigazian University, which is the only Armenian university outside Armenia and in the Armenian diaspora. That's also what we are proud of as well, uh, having a university in anywhere, any other place. Um, the rest of the Lebanese conventions, the other communities, the Shiite, uh, Maronite, Sunni, Orthodox, Syriac, very much respect the Armenians, consider them, consider Armenians hardworking and loyal to Lebanon. Uh, I myself have heard that on TVs uh, by other non-Armenian uh, and neighbors, uh, neighboring uh, like the other uh, communities' bridges. Uh, uh, but uh, because of that uh, identity keeping, uh, similar to the Druze uh, community, they also try to keep their identity by intermarriages. However, they are, today uh, with the new generation, they are they are more free, let's say, to you know, to marry whoever they want. Uh, the Armenian, uh, uh, the dress, uh, the attire uh, is like any other Lebanese, but only certain uh, cultural events, the dresses, the culture, the folk uh, dresses will be put on for special occasions. Occasions, the Armenian cuisine is very much loved in Lebanon. Uh, there are many uh, dishes that are very famous in Lebanon: suju, basar, malabju, mant, fishna, kebab. Uh, and of, of course, Armenians also love the Levantine cuisine. Um, food is very much part of the culture, or, uh, as in India, as in is mu in much of the Middle East and, 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 and the East. So that's much of my uh, few minutes that I wanted to talk about. I can take uh, talk back uh, about the, the Duke and the significance of that. But if there are any questions that um, I can, I would like to. I can answer if there are any questions. Otherwise, I would go to do. No, do. thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Rafi. I mean, we, I think we should hear from you, the Duduk. But before you get into the Duduk itself, perhaps the one thing that stands out about, you know, what you have just said now and everything that you've explained is this. And that is the beauty of Lebanon. I really like the way you explained it, right? The the, the socio-cultural fabric and the mosaic of multiculturalism that Lebanon mm -hmm. provides. I mean, you know, I mm -hmm. come from a country with, what, 27, yes. 28 states. Uh, we are, <laughs> you know, India is a diverse country by itself. Uh, we are... Uh, we and different we, dialects. If, well, languages. We have 19 official languages. Yeah. Uh, Language. uh, uh, of which I speak only four. So, so imagine my trouble when I have to speak to you know, people from other parts. And you were speaking about the fact that you speak Armenian, Arabic, English, French, and, and a little bit of Turkish. I'm always jealous of people like you yeah. because that between Arabic, English, and French, you already cover three international languages within the United Nations. Um, I speak one exactly. uh, of those international languages, which is English. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> but here's, here's the point that I want to make. Uh, with all the diversity that you bring and mm. everything that you're a part of, uh, where do you see the future? 
How do you see the future? Given the fact that you're all integrated, where does the next generation, how does the next generation feel about being Armenian? How will the future generations feel about being Armenian? Do you ever think, gosh, would we lose this? Would we lose who we are as people? Uh, would we lose focus on our roots? Do you think that would ever be the case? Well, um, with globalization happening and, and culture and uh, identity is not something fixed. It's always uh, emerging, something new happening. People are uh, losing their interest or are or attaining a new, an, uh, the, uh, another cultural, another identity, another language uh, because of the, uh, the, the case of, of, of a new country where uh, for example, a community does, is not living in a country where the majority are Armenians. You only have that in Armenia. Uh, uh, however, uh, within the Lebanese context, there, there is um, a kind of um, giving the opportunity, giving the protection within the system of Lebanese society and, and within the parliamentary system politically, uh, and, and that gives uh, the community uh, space to build their own uh, schools and teach Armenian as well and uh, and and maintain their culture. So this is this is uh, for the everyone is a minority in Lebanon in in some sense, uh, whether it's a bigger minority or a smaller minority. So I think within the Lebanese context, it's uh, it's more more. Um, uh, attained and maintained and retained and protected uh, in that sense. Uh, now, in, uh, if you talk about the other diasporas where the Armenians live, that's a, that's a different dynamics happening there in France, where the culture is is regarded much, uh, you know, avant-garde, bigger, higher. You know, that perception issue also comes into play. Uh, 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 so it's a different dynamics over there, but within the Lebanese context, within the Arab world, even uh, Armenians feel at ease and at at accepted, at, and even uh, ha given the freedom to uh, keep their own identity, Armenian identity and culture. Right. No, fantastic. Thanks so much, uh, Rafi, for that background. We want to hear you play the Duduk. I must tell you, I noticed that there are a few Lebanese here huh? in, the, um, in the audience uh -huh. as well. Yes. Um, you know, uh, yes. to, name, to name two, uh, one is with, uh, one is, is a with the United Nations International Organization for Migration, Rula Hamathi. And, uh, and then mm -hmm. there is also Rula, by the way, who says that she has an Armenian connection. Uh, but uh, we also have a Lebanese diplomat based out of the uh, representing Lebanon at the United Nations in Geneva, Hani Char. Uh, so, you know what? This is great. This is wonderful. I think this is great. <laughs> These are great stories for Armenia and Lebanon. Uh, Rafi, let's hear you. Wonderful. Yeah, let me let me tell you about just about the Dujug. It's it's the, it's as you said, the heart and soul of the Armenian people. It's famous national musical instrument of Armenian Armenians. It has a very soothing, melancholic, and yet enriching and deep sound that touches anyone who listens to its voice. It's a very ancient instrument that go, goes back three thousand years. Uh, it is. Uh, taught professionally in the Armenian musical schools uh, here in Lebanon and personally I personally love the instrument it, five years ago I got to know it uh, I had brought from Armenia but then it was only five years ago that I really uh, 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 took the instrument very seriously and uh, learned it professionally uh, I will be uh, per uh, uh, performing a, a, a song called Grung Grung means crane it's the bird it's the name of the bird it, it's called crane uh, and it 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 has a sim the crane the bird has a symbol of migrants and it, this uh, song particularly uh, the, the lyrics uh, talk about talks about uh, the talk about the man living away from his homeland and seeing a crane starts asking the crane about his home and its whereabouts how's my home how is it how's the family and that that's this is this is what uh, this is what i will be uh, performing now
We need to yeah. have a minute silence after that. Thank you. Beautiful, Rafi. You know, I, I can see Jose applauding you. Uh, I will give a shout out to all the disabled people in the world uh, with, with, with this. But what an absolutely fantastic uh, perspective. Uh, if I may say, you know, there, there was a reason why Shakespeare penned, if music be the food of love, then play on. So Rafi, play on, my friend. Play on for as long as you can keep us all happy with this music. Thank you so much for joining us, Rafi. Really appreciate your time, your efforts, and who you are as an individual and what you bring. Uh, thank you, Rafi. That brings me to our next um, uh, migrant achiever. And, and I know Jose would not call himself a migrant achiever. I know there's, there's a lot of confusion about whether Jose is uh, a citizen or a citizen illegal, right? Jose, I, I happen to be reading, what was it called in one of your poems in the Mexican, uh, in, in Citizen Ill Illegal, was called the Mexican-American Disambiguities? Is that what you called it? Huh? And, you know, so if I were to introduce you, I would introduce you by perhaps give me the op op you know, opportunity to, uh, and, and the honor of reading a few lines from your poem. Uh, Mexican-American disambiguities, where you say, and I quote, my parents are Mexicans who are not to be confused with Mexicans still living in Mexico. Those Mexicans call themselves Mexicanos. White folks at parties call them pobrecitos. American colleges call them international students and diverse my mom was white in Mexico and my dad was mestizo. And after they crossed the border, they became diverse, minorities, ethnic, and exotic. Gosh, Jose, you know, if I could have uh, put my own uh, thoughts about having grown up in, in different countries, thought about how my parents moved, uh, you know, I, I really, though not nowhere close to Mexico or the United States, I relate to every word in how you have put this. And, it's, and it really touched me in so many different ways. But interestingly enough, Jose, I, I read about, uh, I read an interview uh, of yours where you were asked to describe yourself. And interestingly enough, you called yourself a poet, an educator, and an aspiring, correct me if I get this wrong, sinvergüenza. Uh, <laughs> and I had to translate what sinvergüenza meant, and it actually says a shameless or a brazen person. Um, <laughs> so here's my thing, my friend. You have already inspired me to be a sinvergüenza, because if this is what sinvergüenza means, then I would love to be a shameless or a brazen person. But, Jose, with that as my uh, opening for you, uh, please give us a little bit of your background first maybe for the next five minutes or so, and then we would like to hear the poet in you. Jose, over to you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, and thank you for sharing, Rafi. That was really beautiful. Um, yeah, so uh, I think maybe, I, 
I think the best way that I can kind of paint a picture about who I am and how I locate myself within the United States and its relationship with Mexico is if I read some poems. So I don't want to spend too much time talking, but I'll give you a, a kind of brief overview of the relationship between the United States and Mexico and then how that kind of plays into how I saw myself growing up as the child of migrants. Um, so Mexico is the country directly south of the United States border. Um, in the 1800s, uh, the United States decided that it believed in this thing called manifest destiny, which was the idea that the United States, which at the time, you know, was probably half the size that it is now, they believed that it was their destiny, that it was, you know, that God had selected the United States, the American people to lead the land from the east coast of the United States all the way to what we now call California, right? That it was destiny for the entire continent to become the United States of America. Um, and so the United States invaded Mexico and their whole plan was to get as much Mexican land from Mexico with as few Mexican people. So there's always been this question about how Mexicans fit into the racial hierarchy in the United States, right? Um, we know from history that the United States enslaved Black people. We know that the United States took land from indigenous people. And so how do uh, Mexican people, which is a people that is not fixed, right, that is fluid, that is, you know, a national identity, but also uh, people with very strong indigenous roots, with very strong, um, how do they fit, right? And so we know from history that the United States did not see Mexican people as, uh, you know, as on the same level as Euro, as Euro-descendant people in the United States. Um, so, they, so I say all that to say that there have always been, quote unquote, Mexican people in the United States. Um, that's been true since the invasion. Um, and the presence of the United States has always loomed large over Mexico. Um, there was this thing called the Monroe Doctrine, where basically the United States declared that no countries in Latin America were really capable of governing themselves. And so they, the United States was going to take on a big brother identity. And so if you study Latin American history, you can find over the years, all of the coups and all of the different military regimes that the United States has supported in various countries, in El Salvador, in Honduras, in Guatemala, in Chile, um, on and on and on, right? Um, so anyway, uh, that's, that's some background. For me, my parents moved to the United States. They were undocumented right before I was born. I was born in Chicago, Illinois, uh, which is really, you know, one of the places that I consider a homeland for myself. Um, and what I remember growing up is that Mexico never came up in any of our history books. Uh, the United States, and I think this was especially true, you know, in the 1990s, had a very kind of um, United States first vision of history, right? We, we learned everything about the United States, but we didn't really spend time thinking about the world, only when it in, in, interacted with the United States, right? Um, and there were three moments when Mexicans popped up in United States history, right? One is during colonization when Christopher Columbus and the Spanish invade Mexico um, and slaughter a lot of indigenous people. One is during the Mexican-American War when the United States, you know, moves into Mexico and slaughters a lot of Mexican people. And then the last part, you know, and then Mexicans disappear for a hundred years until immigration happens and all we learn is that there's this wave of immigration and then Mexicans disappear again. Um, 
So for me, one of the one of the things that led me to becoming a poet was just wondering what happens in all of those in between years, right? What happens? Uh, it's not like, you know, the Spanish invade Mexico and then history stops, right? Uh, we know that there's connected histories. Um, and so I wanted to write poetry because for me, it was a way of kind of asking questions about, you know, what it means to be Mexican in America, given the history of dominance, getting, given the history of, uh, yeah, given the history of dominance, given the history of American imperialism. Um, and I wanted to think about what it meant to be, what it meant to be um, a son of migrants after the fact. One of the things that's true about how migration is covered in the United States is it's only covered in moments of crisis. So the news only really talks about migration after a great tragedy has happened. And, you know, it's not that I don't think those moments are newsworthy, certainly they're newsworthy, but I think that what it means is that we don't pay attention to how the ripples of migration kind of ripple out over the years, right? Um, I think about my own parents and when they were undocumented with, before they attained legal status in the United States, we met a with a lawyer every week for years and my parents never told us why we were there. Um, and I think about those silences that exist within families, within communities. Um, and it makes me, you know, I, I want to write about how those silences affect us. And so when I say that I want to be a sinvergüenza, what I'm saying is that I was taught to be, to carry a lot of shame and a lot of kind of secrets around certain parts of my Mexican identity, right? Because it was this thing that was, um, you know, that was not, we, we didn't learn about it in school and it was, uh, and it was um, a source of shame for my parents. And it was, uh, and it was just very, you know, it led to a lot of silences. And so when I say I want to be a sinvergüenza, that's what I'm talking about. I want to be, I want to step into the light of who I am and be proud of who I am. Um, and so I'll stop there, but thank you so much for the introduction. And I'm excited to read some poems. Please do. We're all yours. Excellent. Jose, so I'm going Jose, to. How, how would you like to do this? I mean, would you have uh, two, three poems for us, uh, and uh, and then maybe also conclude it uh, with uh, with your reflections as to how these came about? Uh, a couple of minutes on that, but so let's say two or three poems. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll read three poems, and yeah, I'm going to start with the poem that you mentioned: Mexican American disambiguation. Right. Uh, and disambiguation is a word um, that I took from Wikipedia. Uh, if you look up the word rose in Wikipedia, it'll ask you if you want to disambiguate, right? It'll say, what type of rose do you mean? Do you mean rose the actress? Do you mean rose the flower? Do you mean rose, you know, the perfume smell? It'll ask you to kind of disambiguate what you're talking about. So this is Mexican-American disambiguation. It's after the poet Idris Goodwin. My parents are Mexican, who are not to be confused with Mexican Americans or Chicanos. I am a Chicano from Chicago, which means I'm a Mexican American with a fancy college degree and a few tattoos. My parents are Mexican, who are not to be confused with Mexicans still living in Mexico. Those Mexicans call themselves Mexicanos. White folks at parties call them pobrecitos. American colleges call them international students and diverse. My mom was white in Mexico and my dad was mestizo. And after they crossed the border, they became diverse and minorities and ethnic and exotic. But my parents call themselves Mexicanos who again should not be confused for Mexicanos living in Mexico. Those Mexicanos might call my family gringos which is the word my family calls white folks and white folks call my parents interracial. Colleges say, put them on a brochure. My parents say, que significa esa palabra? I point out that all the men in my family marry lighter skinned women. 
That's the Chicano in me, which means it's the fancy college degrees in me, which is also diverse of me. Everything in me is diverse, even when I eat American foods like hamburgers, which to clarify are American when a white person eats them and diverse when my family eats them. So much of America can be understood like this. My parents were undocumented when they came to this country. And by undocumented, I mean sin papeles. And by sin papeles, I mean royally fucked, which should not be confused with the American dream, though the two are cousins. Colleges are not looking for undocumented diversity. My dad became a citizen, which should not be confused with keys to the house. We were safe from deportation, which should not be confused with walking the plank, though they're cousins. I call that sociology, but that's just the Chicano in me who should not be confused with the diversity in me or the Mexicano in me who is constantly fighting with the upwardly mobile in me, who is good friends with the Mexican American in me, who the colleges love, but only on brochures, who the government calls non-white Hispanic or white Hispanic, who my parents call mijo, even when I don't come home so much. Cool. So that's one poem. Thank you for listening. Uh, this will be my second poem and then I'll read one more. This poem is called Ars Poetica. If you are not familiar with the poetry tradition and Ars Poetica is kind of like a um, statement of purpose for poetry. So this is kind of like, I wrote this thinking about like why, why I write poetry. Ars Poetica. Migration is derived from the word migrate, which is a verb defined by Merriam-Webster as to move from one country, place, or locality to another. Plot twist. Migration never ends. My parents moved from Jalisco, Mexico to Chicago in 1987. They were dislocated from Mexico by capitalism, and they arrived in Chicago just in time to be dislocated by capitalism. Question, is migration possible if there is no other land to arrive in? My work is to imagine. My family started migrating in 1987 and they never stopped. I was born mid-migration. I made my home in that motion. Let me try again. I tried to be American, but America is toxic. I tried to become Mexican, but Mexico is toxic. My work is to do more than reproduce the toxic stories I inherited and learned. In other words, just because it's art doesn't mean it's inherently nonviolent. My work is to write poems that make my people feel safe, seen, or otherwise loved. My work is to make my enemies feel afraid, angry, or otherwise ignored. My people are my people. My enemies, capitalism. Susan Sontag says, victims are interested in the representation of their own sufferings. Remix, survivors are interested in the representation of their own survival. My work, survival. Question, why poems? Answer. And, you know, I see that we're at 940 New York City time where I am. So I think maybe I'll just read those two poems. Um, but thank you for listening to my poems. I, you know, I'll say part of what, why I wrote this second poem is because um, Mexican nationalism is something that is um, controversial, both in the United States and in other parts of Latin America. Um, certainly Mexico experiences like a lot of uh, um, pressure and colonialism from the United States, but in the United States, there are many more Mexican Americans than there are Salvadoran Americans or, or you know, Guatemal Guatemaltecos, uh, and so that means that Mexicans have a, you know, a lot an oversized presence in American culture, right? Um, and that leads to uh, sometimes like Mexicans looking down on Central Americans, for example. Um, and it's and so I wanted to make clear that uh, you know the answer to one toxic relationship, which is this American relationship, is not making a, a second toxic relationship that kind of looks down on other migrant people, right? Um, so with that, you know, I'll say thank you for listening. Um, I hope my poems were useful, and I'm really 
happy that I was able to participate today. Wow, thank you, Jose. Um, Rafi, Jose, what can I say except respect? Huh? Thank you very much, really, for making this. Um, we had no clue how this would work out. We had no idea as to, you know, how we would bring in uh, achievers such as yourselves. Um, but um, uh, more than anything else, I'm humbled. I'm humbled by having listening to you, Rafi and Jose, and I'm grateful for your presence uh, in this conversation and just broader part of humanity. Uh, thank you and keep serving and keep doing what you do best. Thank you very much. Namaste, as I would say in India. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. All the very best to both of you. Yeah. Um, to the organizers, uh, Sada and team, back to you. Do we have anybody from GRFDT here? Yes. Yes. Go ahead, <clears throat> Dr. Sony. 